November 13th, 2020 is the 15th anniversary of the tragic passing of Eddie Guerrero. Eddie shuffled off this mortal coil while in the prime of his life and career at the age of 38. And in the decade and a half since, his reputation and legend have only continued to grow. His work lionized and a new generation of wrestlers citing him as one of, if not their biggest, inspiration. Eddie only wrestled in WWE for about five years, but managed to accomplish much in that time, including becoming WWE WWE Champion at a time where that was almost impossible for a performer of his size. Of course, your pappy had a long and illustrious career before that, making history in Mexico, Japan, ECW, and WCW before he went to work for Titan Sports. With such a long and varied career, there are possibly a few things you may not know or not remember about one of the all-time greats. Did he always get along with his tag partners or other co-workers? Where exactly did the Latino Heat nickname and character come from? Why did he unmask in Mexico only to put one on in Japan. Find out about all of this and more as we celebrate the life and career of the WWE Hall of Famer. I'm Sam Driver from Cultaholic.com and here are 10 things you didn't know about Eddie Guerrero. Join us. Number 10. He was resented in his early Mexico days. As a member of the famous Guerrero wrestling family, Eddie was immediately a big deal when he burst onto the Mexican wrestling scene in the mid-1980s. He'd grown up in the business, with his father and older brothers all earning their livings as wrestlers, and he even had a ring in his backyard. Eddie loved the sport and almost pursued amateur wrestling, before an injury prevented him from taking a scholarship that he'd been offered, and he turned his attention toward the pro game instead. He had the passion and the ability, and his name opened up doors that were perhaps shut to others. This naturally bred resentment, and Eddie had to deal with a lot of jealousy when he was breaking in south of the border. The rest of the luchadors felt like he hadn't paid his dues and didn't deserve to be featured in high-profile matches on major shows. Eddie also had issues listening to his opponents who spoke in Spanish, and needed to re-familiarize himself with the language as it was making matches difficult. If his opponents even wanted to cooperate with him, that is. Many took their frustrations out on Eddie in the ring, with matches descending into full-on fistfights on occasion. Number 9. The first luchador in history to voluntarily unmask Eddie persevered in Mexico and eventually won over his critics, paying his dues and producing great work in the ring. He also at one point stopped wrestling as Eddie Guerrero and adopted the gimmick of Mascara Mexica, aka the Magic Mask. Eddie worked under a hood while wrestling for CMLL, but left the company in acrimonious circumstances in 1992, was blackballed and then signed with rival promotion AAA. Magic Mask was a popular character, but CMLL owned the rights to it, necessitating that Eddie drop the act, which he did in historic fashion, as before his first AAA match, he became the first luchador in history to voluntarily unmask. He explained in a promo afterwards that he was doing so in order to carry on the Guerrero legacy. Typically, a masked wrestler will have to lose a mask versus mask match, as there's a real significance placed on it in Mexican wrestling history. Eddie was of course aware of that significance, but he also had a rebellious streak in him, and at the time, AAA was something of an outlaw promotion that liked to rock the boat. And besides, it would truly be a crime to keep such an incredible mullet hidden from view, wouldn't it? Number 8. He wasn't the original choice for Black Tiger 2. Of course, Mascara Mahika wasn't the last time Eddie would wear a mask in the ring, because over a decade later, he put one on again as Mr. America in WWE. Just kidding. That was obviously Rhino. After enhancing his reputation in Mexico, Eddie was invited to participate in New Japan's Top of the Super Juniors tournament in 1992, impressing fans, wrestlers, and officials enough to be invited back and eventually become a regular. A few tours in, Eddie was presented with the opportunity to wrestle as Black Tiger the perennial rival of Tiger Mask. First portrayed by the late great Mark Rollerball Rocco, Black Tiger was a popular gimmick and the offer suggested that New Japan had long-term plans for Guerrero. Eddie would become Black Tiger for the rest of his time in New Japan, save for a brief return under his own name in 2002, where he would team with Black Tiger 3, portrayed by WCW's Silver King. Eddie enjoyed a lot of success as Black Tiger, but he wasn't even New Japan's first choice for the role. The office had initially approached Fit Finley about it, but he turned it down as he didn't want to commit to the company as his priority was his European bookings. Just imagine Finley wearing those little cat ears though. Adorable. Number 7. He initially didn't like Art Bar. 
While wrestling under a mask in Japan, Eddie turned heel and was teamed up with Art Bar back in AAA. Initially called American Machine, the fans christened them Los Gringos Locos, and Eddie admitted retrospectively that he didn't like the idea at all. Though it was easy heat, as Eddie would naturally be booed for wearing the American flag and deriding Mexico, given his roots, Guerrero was unsure of it and had to be convinced by his partner and promoter, Antonio Peña. Though they would grow to become one of the most legendary teams in Lucha history, Eddie and Art did not get along at all when they first started tagging together. Their issues extended beyond the ring, as Eddie admitted that he simply didn't like him, and as a result, he found it difficult going into work. However, over time, he began warming to Art, and the two ended up becoming great friends. The duo was set to come into ECW together, but sadly, Bar tragically passed away before that could happen. Eddie chose to go alone, dedicating his ECW television title win to his late friend and performing the frog splash as a finisher in his honor. As a side note, did you know that neither Eddie nor Art Art invented the frog splash. Art had stolen it from Eddie, but the move was actually originated by a luchador named La Fiera. There you go. Something to make you sound clever next time you see a frog splash on telly. Number six, he almost died in a 1999 car crash. When Art passed away before his time, it scared Eddie into straightening out his act and kept him away from the pill bottle, at least at that time. After a few frustrating and unhappy years in WCW, his drug problem began spiraling out of control to the point where it almost cost him his life. On New Year's Day in 1999, Eddie took five big shots of Renutrient, a tranquilizer that was basically liquid GHB, while driving on his way back from the convenience store, which he had gone to in order to pick up eggs and beer. He fell asleep at the wheel doing 130 30 miles per hour, sailed off an embankment and crashed his car, waking up in the emergency room later with doctors working tirelessly to help save his leg, which was badly damaged. The truth is, Eddie was lucky to be alive in the first place, as paramedics couldn't believe that he had survived the wreck that they pulled him out of. The vehicle was apparently as flat as a pancake. Eddie was initially told that he would be lucky to ever walk again, let alone wrestle, but after six months of painful physical therapy and rest, he was able to return. The accident sadly didn't curtail his addiction which continued for another few years. Number five, his famous nickname came from the birdcage. Soon after jumping to WWE from WCW, Eddie was paired up with China, a move that would make him a superstar. The unlikely couple were a hit, and given more time to portray a character in promos and vignettes, as well as in the ring, Eddie was able to show a different side of his personality, hamming it up as the eccentric Latino Heat. Ah oh, yes, Latino Heat, the Latin Lothario with a fiery temper. But just where did that come from? While the character was a collaboration between Guerrero and WWE, the name itself came directly from Eddie. Well, not exactly directly, since it was adapted from something that he'd seen one night while watching the 1996 film The Birdcage. In the comedy, Hank Azaria's character tells Robin Williams that he cannot deal with his Guatemalanness, his natural heat. Eddie said the same about his Latino heat off the cuff in the build-up to WrestleMania 16, and when it received a big reaction from the audience, WWE felt they had something there and ran with it. Which just goes to show you that wrestling folks should look to the movies for inspiration from time to time. At at least that's what I, Sam the Terminator Driver, believe. Number four, he had a backstage fight with Charlie Haas. Eddie's fiery temper was not just part of his Latino character, but also a real aspect of his personality. Never afraid to tell someone his true feelings, Guerrero got into many backstage arguments in his career, and sometimes those arguments turned physical. His locker room scuffle with Kurt Angle, no prizes for guessing who won that one, is well documented, but you might not know that Eddie also fought with the former member of Team Angle, Charlie Haas. The incident occurred on an overseas tour in 2003. During a match between Los Guerreros and the world's greatest tag team, Eddie suffered an elbow injury and asked his opponent to go easy on him, which, according to Eddie, they neglected to do. When they got backstage, the veteran confronted the rookies and pushed Haas in the face, the amateur wrestling standout responding by pushing Guerrero against a wall. Shelton tried to get involved and was punched by Chavo before it was broken up by Bill DeMott. Everything was hashed out after the fact and the two teams kissed and made up, with no further punishment given. Number three, he was relieved to lose the WWE title. After coming back from the brink, cleaning himself up and doing some of the best work of his career, Eddie was rewarded for his efforts with a WWE title run. After beating Brock Lesnar in a classic match at No Way Out 2004, Eddie was on top of the world and followed it up with a victory in another belter with Kurt Angle at WrestleMania 20, celebrating at the end of the show with his best friend Chris Benoit, who had also reached the pinnacle of the profession on that night. However, in the aftermath of the Showcase of the Immortals, the next big thing and the Olympic hero both departed 
departed for different reasons, leaving the SmackDown roster looking thinner than Spike Dudley during a fast. With attendances, ratings, and pay-per-view buys declining, Guerrero as champion felt the pressure and began to crack. Tired and run down, Eddie was involved in more unfortunate incidents, such as when he lost it at a small group of fans who were booing him at a house show in Germany. He also had another, much less serious, car accident. Losing the belt to JBL at the Great American Bash, Eddie was actually happy to be relieved of the burden that came with being the brand's figurehead. Number two, he had non-televised matches with The Undertaker in 2005. Had Eddie lived, we would have likely seen him in some genuine dream matches as he entered the winter of his career. Bouts with Shawn Michaels, Triple H, and The Undertaker would have all been something to see. And in fact, Latino Heat did have singles matches with the Deadman, four in total, though they were witnessed by just a few thousand people at house shows in the summer of 2005, only a few months before Eddie passed away. A feud between the legends had been pitched and dismissed in the past, and their quartet of non-televised bouts were a way to test out the dynamic to see if it actually worked. According to former SmackDown lead writer Alex Greenfield, who was present for a couple of the matches, they were excellent, with the action revolving around Guerrero trying to remove the dead man's eye. Tell you what, WWE should copy that concept 15 years later. Bet that would be great. Sadly, no pictures or footage of these rare meetings exist. Please feel free to prove me wrong, WWE Network. And only those who bought tickets to those events got to enjoy them. The only real time the two met in a televised match was the four-way main event of Armageddon 2004, which also included JBL and Booker T. Number one, he still wrestled on the indies during his WWE comeback in 2002. When Eddie was fired by WWE in late 2001, he endeavored to turn his life and career around, completing rehab and dedicating himself to working as much as possible on the independent scene in a bid to rebuild his reputation. Latino Heat was in demand, wrestling all over the world and getting great reviews not only for his work in the ring, but also his conduct outside of it. Well, WWE were watching and decided to give him a second chance, offering him a contract in March of 2002, several months after letting him go. When WWE hired Guerrero back, however, he still had some independent bookings on his schedule, and though he was now a WWE superstar again, he wanted to honor them. So with WWE's blessing, Eddie did just that, wrestling a few matches for the so-called minor leagues while back in the thick of it on global television in a feud with Rob Van Dam. On April 19th, he traveled to Dayton, Ohio to face Colt Cabana and CM Punk in a title match for IWA Mid-South. Two nights later, he beat RVD at Backlash to win the Intercontinental title. But just because he was a WWE title, holder didn't mean he was finished up on the indies, because, as champ, he made a final appearance for Ring of Honor six days later, teaming with the Amazing Red to beat the SAT.